new template for DNP practical examination. An exam which always create apprehension unless they are uh, aware of the exact pattern. To have a very eminent faculty and academician to talk on this, Dr. Baljit Singh, who is the professor and head of Department of Anesthesiology, STT Medical College Hospital and Research Institute, Delhi. Ex-director, professor, Department of Anesthesiology from J.B. Pant Hospital, New Delhi. I'm really happy and honored to welcome you, sir, on my personal behalf and on behalf of ISA Kerala State Chapter. Welcome, Dr. Baljit Singh, sir. The second part of the topic is uh, on retrograde or blind nasal intubation by Dr. R. P. Gadu, who is currently professor and head of Department of Anesthesiology at D.Y. Patil Medical College, Navi, Mumbai, the former professor at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. A person who always loved to tackle the difficult airways. And uh, I'm sure his talk will have a lot of his uh, tips and uh, his uh, practical experiences. A person who always uh, loved to be with Kerala and loved to come to Kerala. Sir, I am really happy and honored you, uh, to, to welcome you to th this program by ISA Kerala State Chapter. I take this opportunity to welcome our uh, President-elect ISA National, Dr. Venkatagiri KM, today's uh, webinar coordinators, Dr. Rajesh MC, who is the Scientific Committee Chairman of ISA Kerala State Chapter, and Vijish Bernagobal, who is the Governing Council Member of ISA Kerala State Chapter. Welcome, Dr. Giri, Dr. Rajesh, and Dr. Vijish Bernagobal. I welcome Dr. Bindal Isaac Matthew, our active and energetic uh, secretary. And uh, we have uh, senior members with us, uh, Dr. Bimeshar and others. Uh, I take this opportunity to welcome you all and welcome our delegates to this meeting. Now, a few words uh, from Dr. Giri. Dr. Giri, please. Good evening, uh, President uh, Dr. Nazar, Secretary Binil, Coordinators uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh and Vijesh. Uh, today's faculty is uh, uh, Dr. Bajit Singh and Dr. Gedo, sir. And we have senior uh, members of past President Dr. Kuchel Babu, past Secretary Dr. Bhimeshwar, uh, Dr. Um, Udlajar Kanchi and many others among the uh, participants in this webinar. This is uh, particularly for the PGs and Vinil uh, was very particular that uh, we have to have some teaching because the uh, new exam pattern changed and there is something called as ward round for the uh, DNB. So our PG should know what it is. It is for them to take the benefit and uh, Dr. Baljit Singh is the person to tell about that uh, in and out of uh, what the new pattern, how to proceed and uh, what is expected of you, what is the new pattern and all. So we have requested him and he has happily agreed to uh, give his uh, knowledge and tell what exactly it is and uh, it is for the benefit of PGs, but uh, PG should take the benefit. Today actually Kuchel Babu asked me in the noon, Giri, the Kerala webinars are too good and my PGs want to see that, uh, how to see the old webinars and uh, where will we get because the PGs are so if you have seen earlier one message, one PG has said that only because of this I passed my exam. That was the reply we are getting from the feedback. Uh, those who have participated in this regularly, both the weekly and our uh, uh, pre-exam crash course. So it is very popular and is left for uh, our uh, people to take the benefit. And uh, we will be continuing with this every weekend uh, with the same login ID and uh, passwords. So, I thank all the faculties who agree for our request and take class because we select the eminent faculties from all over India and it's the PGs to take the benefit of it. Otherwise, you will have to travel a lot. Now, see, again, you can't travel. ISA National has given another uh, release that uh, another three months, uh, there will not be any uh, physical meetings of ISA because COVID is again coming. So we'll have to depend on this. So PGs, please tell others also take benefit because teachings are less and all. Some more will come uh, in the coming time. Let us see how we will go ahead and uh, how best we can give to the uh, members of ISA. Thank you very much, uh, President. And I should thank both uh, uh, my good friends, Dr. Baljitji and Dr. Gedoji for uh, agreeing and uh, spending their time here. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Giri, for the inspiring words. Uh, we'll straight away go to the academics. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Rajesh MC and Dr. Vijesh Gonobal to take over and proceed the academics. Dr. Rajesh and Vijesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser. And uh, as uh, Dr. Nasser and uh, Dr. Vingadagiri said, this is a, re a request session from the postgraduates. There was a lot of requests from the postgraduates because last time they have introduced a, a program called ward rounds and uh, many of the postgraduates are confused what to expect and uh, uh, from the ward uh, ward rounds and what uh, uh, and uh, there was a uniformity in the way it was conducted across the india also so we have requested uh, uh, our senior faculty member and uh, one of the regular examiners for the md and the dnb session baljit singh and uh, he's uh, well known um, uh, speaker and faculty of the ISA pro all the ISA programs. And uh, for the benefit of postgraduates, I'll just uh, uh, give a short introduction about him. He's a physiology and critical care faculty of medical science at University Gram. And uh, he was former associate editor of Cardiac Anesthesia and Indian Journal of Pain and member editorial board of Indian Journal of Anesthesia and Journal of Anesthesia and Clinical Pharmacology and joint editor of Indian Journal of Health Science and Critical Care. And uh, he has over 120 publications in, uh, in national and international journals and 12 book chapters. Over to you, Beljit, sir. Oh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ajesh, uh, for very kind words, very generous words, I must say that. And uh, before I proceed, uh, I would like to thank, uh, you know, the organizing team for giving me the opportunity to uh, be with you all, and particularly the postgraduate students. I would especially thank uh, Dr. Venkat Giri KM, who is uh, president-elect of ISA National. And of course, to Dr. Abdul Nazir, for, uh, who is president of ISA State Chapter Kerala. And Dr. Benil uh, Matthews, uh, very active uh, secretary of your state. And of course, uh, Dr. Benugopal, who is a GC member of ISA Kerala chapter. Besides that, my dear friend, uh, uh, Dr. Bimeshwar, and uh, of course, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gedu, who will be uh, the speaker uh, with me. But now let's uh, go ahead uh, with the talk. I am going to share my screen. Yeah. Uh, is my screen uh, visible there? It's visible, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where it is. Okay. So, well, uh, examination is uh, one of the most uh, unforgettable experiences of life. And I think we all have faced it and we all remember. Uh, you know, how we did in our examination, how much worried, how much stressed we were at the time of the examination and, you know, you know how, when, when the examination was over, how stressed we were, we were. There is a definite scope of the examination and uh, that scope is to test the ability of a candidate to assess a specified medical condition for conduct of anesthesia. The student is expected to take history, elicit physical science, and collate all those physical signs to establish diagnosis. And of course, with a differential diagnosis as well as the other possibilities. He should be able to spot the diagnosis of some very obvious medical conditions. And he should also interpret uh, ECGs, XHS, ABGs, pulmonary function tests, and capnographs as well. He should be able to evaluate the risk of surgery and anesthesia. And he should be well versed with the discussion of management of acute emergencies related to that patient uh, who is given a case, who is uh, given to him for a discussion. And while all this is going on, there is one big question in the mind of the examiner. Will the patient be safe in his hands? Now, if the examiner is convinced that, yes, the patient will be safe in his hands, the candidate goes through. And in case he finds that he is making mistakes where the, there is a risk to the safety of the patient, well, he will have to uh, do a serious thought before uh, putting his result. Now, uh, there is uh, the revised pattern of examination which uh, occurred during the last examination which uh, the National Board had conducted. Uh, 
you are familiar with the old pattern. There were four uh, OSCE com four uh, components of self examination. One is the OSCE component. That is OSCE is the objective structured clinical examination. The next component is VIVOC, and then is the ward rounds. The clinical case examination mm -hmm. comes next, and the candidate must obtain one hundred and fifty uh, out of three hundred marks to pass uh, during this. And uh, now the national board had created more centers to minimize the movement of the staff and the students in the wake of uh, the pandemic that we are going through. It is just for the safety of everyone that they have done it. This is a bit of a time schedule uh, of uh, the day. Uh, 8 to 8.30, there is reporting of the students, there is assembly and the attendance. Students uh, thereafter uh, are given some briefing, what to do, what not to do. Distribution of the answer sheets is there. Then comes the OSCE, uh, which is run from the National Board of Examination Command Center. Then there is a short tea break, and thereafter is the Viva OC and ward rounds. Lunch break follows, and then is the clinical case examination, and that's the end of the examination. Let's come to the OSCE component. <clears throat> there are 25 stations. So to say there are stations, but it's not actually a station. All the students are seated in a big hall, where you know all social distancing norms are observed. The students are at a distance of one to two meters from each other. Each OSCE has uh, six marks. And all these OSCEs are displayed on a big monitor, uh, which is there in the hall. You get four minutes to answer each OSCE question. After seven stations are through, the candidate is given a break of four minutes so that he can just stretch his leg, stretch his neck, move around and feel comfortable a bit before the next set of seven questions come back again. The time allotted for the questions will be displayed on the screen on the top of uh, the OSCE uh, slide. And uh, the questions of one station may be in one or more slides. So it's quite possible OSCE number five may have two different slides for the same question. And a question may also have two components. It may be a 1A and 1B. <clears throat> and as I told you that all the stations would be run from the command center of the National Board of Examination simultaneously all over the country. And there are about 45 to 50 centers. So all 50 centers have display of these OSCEs by the National Board from the control uh, center uh, simultaneously all. Now let's see what the OSCEs are like. Now, this is a sample of the station one. This one A suggests that there has to be one B as well. So this is half the OSCE. This is the time that is displayed in the right upper corner. You can see the digit 200. The moment the slide is projected, this number goes on downing. There is a uh, goes on uh, decreasing. Uh, you know, it, there is a countdown. It will be one. Uh, 59, 158, 157. So that's how it goes on. On the left side, what we can see is one of two. Now this says that this is part one of the two slides for that particular OSCE. So one A also means that this is one uh, half of the OSCE. Now the question is like a 45 year old male presented to the casualty with palpitations for 30 minutes blood pressure of 80 to 50 millimeters of mercury and the ECG is shown below. So there comes the ECG. And uh, the questions that uh, are asked from the candidate is, what is your diagnosis based on the ECG? And what is the criteria of your diagnosis? When they ask for the criteria of the diagnosis, it means that you have to describe what are the changes that you see on this ECG from the normal ECG pattern. So you have to describe everything. And how will you manage this? So that is the, these are the questions which are asked from the 1A OSCE of, uh, uh, of OSCE 1. Now, the next part is 1B. OSCE 1 is part B. Two of two suggest that this is a second slide of the first OSCE or OSCE one, and the timer again starts with two. It will go down 159, 158, and it will go on till it is zero. 
after that time the slide will disappear from the screen now this uh, oski is a 35 year old male patient presents with fever for the last one month cough and purulent expectoration for the last 10 days and there is history of him abscess for one day his chest x ray is shown this is what x ray chest looks like and the questions that are asked from the student describe the findings that you see in this x ray chest what is your diagnosis and how you will manage this now you have 2 minutes to answer these three questions on that sheet of paper which is given to you where it is mentioned oski 1 now we go to another sample uh, oski 2 one of one means that there is only one slide of there is only one main question main stem and then there are questions of that one of one means it's just one it doesn't have one a one b like i had shown you the previous uh, in the previous slide now four shows here that this is 4 minutes for this oski because there is only one so 4 minutes of this oski the moment this oski is displayed on the screen countdown will start from here it will go on 359 358 357 or so now here the stem of the question is a 55 year old man is brought to the casualty with history of acute left hemiparesis of 12 hours duration the questions that are asked us are what is the finding and diagnosis on this brain ct of the patient is he a good candidate for intravenous thrombolysis what surgical procedure may be required and what medication may be given to prevent the recurrence so this is how the oskis will be displayed <coughs> uh, to the students we go to the next component that is viva voci i think uh, most of the students are familiar with this it has four stations at each station there is one examiner sitting station 1 is nrci equipment and drugs this includes nrci machine as well it also include the fluids the next station is investigations that has ecgs x ray chest abg reports capnography pulmonary function tests etc the next station is research station and the airway management there will be a mannequin over there and you will be may be asked to uh, demonstrate a particular procedure which the examiner wants you to do the fourth station is of recent advances communication and research methodology when i say communication it is the communication between the doctor and the patient or the next of kin of the patient or some relative of the patient who is there in case the patient is seriously sick how well you communicate your concerns of the patient to the patient's attendants and how well you answer their their issues whatever doubts they have you need to clarify that there'll be a volunteer who would be available there and you will be given a situation that okay this patient was brought to the casualty with say a uh, road traffic accident had a head injury patient is deeply unconscious and you know he is very serious so how are you going to convey this news to the patient's attendants who come to hospital to see him now at each station you have 5 minutes to answer whatever the examiner wants uh, you to uh, answer and there are 10 marks per viva station that you have and each examiner of course since he is sitting on on one station so each examiner is marking independently uh, at at the station that he is stationed on the third which dr venkatgiri mentioned is the ward round which is a new introduction from the last uh, time that we had examination dnb examination now i'm sure you would be familiar that when uh, we were mbbs students we used to attend uh, the, the rounds of the surgeon you know in the surgical ward of the physician or the professor or the senior doctor you would accompany him from bed to bed and uh, the teacher would stand by every bed and uh, you know the diagnosis of the patient and he will ask question okay this patient has bronchospasm and you know how are you going to manage this patient has this problem how are you going to manage so there will be some sort of a discussion between the examiner or with the teacher and uh, of course the student whoever is there at the time of the round it is 
simply a replication of the whole process with regard to NRCZ. Now there are four ward rounds. Each round uh, has 10 marks. So that adds to the total 40 marks for the student. There'll be four real patients, real patients. All the patients will undergo RT-PCR tests to be sure that they are COVID negative. This is for the safety of the students as well as the staff, which is working there during the examination. And all these four patients are marked as table one, two, three, and four. Again, there is independent marking by individual examiners at the center because the students will be appearing before that examiner one-to-one. -one. And every candidate will face all the four examiners. The patients which are there for the ward rounds have a very clearly visible diagnostic clues. Either the diagnosis is very simple and straight, you just have a look at the patient's face and you can make out what exactly it is. Or there are some very important clues from which you can very easily make a diagnosis. The candidates are allowed a quick look on these patients. They can ask a brief history and general physical examination can be performed if the candidate wants to do that. Make a quick diagnosis of that patient and then the examiner will ask questions thereafter. I'm giving you some examples like this. Now, this is a patient which is very obviously, there is a huge thyroid gland which is there and you can see uh, the eyes and I'm sure every student will be able to uh, answer that with regard to the diagnosis, okay? The examiner would be interested not as much in the diagnosis because he knows that the diagnosis is very, very obvious. He will, having given you this particular case, he will ask you as to how you're going to confirm the diagnosis. What are the NRCA concerns in this patient? What kind of nerve injuries can happen in the post uh, the manifestation of the nerve injuries in the post immediate post operative uh, you know patient uh, immediate post operative period? What can be the difficulty at the time of uh, induction of anesthesia? How are you going to manage a difficult airway? So the examiner can ask you questions related to this problem. He may not go into the details. He can ask you about how to establish diagnosis, how to confirm diagnosis, but he would be more concerned with regard to the management of anesthesia for that particular patient. I give another example. This is one child. Here again, the diagnosis is pretty obvious, the hydrocephalus. So he can ask you questions with regard to, okay, obviously, uh, what is the diagnosis? And what are the causes of uh, hydrocephalus? Okay. And how are you going to manage NRCA in this particular patient? The next picture that you see, you can see a very clear, obvious diagnosis again in this patient. So the examiner is going to ask you, how are you going to manage NRCA in this patient? What position you would perform? What are your concerns? Obviously, the concerns in both the patients, apart from the pathology that the patient has, is that they are small children. So concerns with regard to pediatric anesthesia. It will always be a good idea to express your concerns divided into two components. One, the concern because of the age group of the patient and the concerns with regard to the pathology of the patient. Here, in the first case, since the head is very large, so how are you going to manage intubation in this patient? What sort of position that you would have for this child so that you can intubate the patient? Uh, comfortably. And here again, if you put the patient's spine, there's risk to, uh, the, the, to, to the, the swelling here. So that can burst. So how are you going to make sure that this is well preserved? And then after intubation, the patient is uh, put prone for the surgeon to perform surgery. Another example here again, <clears throat> the diagnosis is pretty obvious. It's a cleft lip very clearly. You don't need much. Uh, you you know, it, it is, it's written on the face of the patient. Here there is, apart from the cleft lip, there is a palate as well. So again, the examiner is going to ask you, how are you going to manage intubation in this patient? What are other concerns that you have in this particular patient? And with regard to the palate, he may ask you further, you know, you know like what is the, you know, how the development of the face takes place and why is this defect there in, in these children? One more example, this is a patient with tracheostomy. 
well, the viva in this particular case would start. Okay, what are the indications? I'm just giving you uh, the possibilities. The examiner can ask anything. What are the uh, indications for tracheostomy? Immediate tracheostomy, you know, or or it is elective tracheostomy. What are the complications of tracheostomy? And many other questions which are related to uh, tracheostomy. There again, there's a patient over here, so the concerns will be there. He might, you know, uh, with with uh, either of the patients might even ask you, uh, how will you perform percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy? What are the complications? And everything related to the management of the patient. Another example that you have. <clears throat> Here you can see that the person has fracture of the arm. With this kind of picture, obviously, you will not be able to say where the fracture exactly is. But well, the patient has a fracture on the arm, whether it is both bone forearm here or there is some uh, injury to the elbow joint as well. So he will ask you, what is the NRC of choice for this particular patient? Obviously, you will go ahead with, okay, sir. I, I would like to have brachial plexus block and the viva starts from there. I mean, what, which, which particular approach would you prefer? What drugs, what technique, and you know, how are you uh, going to manage your patient? <clears throat> this uh, another example, I'm giving more examples of ward round because that is what I was specifically asked as to what kind of cases are expected in ward round. Here again, you can see this, that, that this person hardly has a chin. And uh, this is going to be a uh, hell of a job for any anesthetist to intubate this patient. The viva would thus start with, how are you going to manage this patient? What are your options? Whether it's fiber optic, blind needle, some people like to prefer, or you know whatever you have, or you would like to have uh, tracheostomy preoperatively, you, you can be asked anything. And this is another patient with contacture on the front of neck following burns. That's another issue. Uh, for a anesthetist with regard to management of the air. This is another case. Diagnosis is pretty obvious. Kyphoscoliosis this person has. Here also, uh, there is kyphoscoliosis. So the viva might uh, be based on uh, starting right from uh, the respiratory parameters, the values and everything. Uh, and of course, the postoperatively management of uh, this patient uh, with regard to the restrictive disorder that patient has preoperatively. Another case, uh, there's a, a case of pregnancy. Well, uh, he, uh, the, the patient may be there in the ward with the, apart from uh, this, apart from the pregnancy, the patient might have associated anemia or the patient might have hypertension. The examiner may give you a reading. Okay, this patient is having, uh, is, is pregnant and the blood pressure is like this. How are you going to manage anesthesia in this particular patient? Or how are you going to manage uh, obstetric analgesia in this patient? I hope these examples will be good enough for the candidates to have uh, a fair uh, idea of what ward round is all about. We now come to the fourth component of the examination, that is the clinical component. It consists of two clinical cases of 30 mic, 35 marks each, and uh, you will be having uh, 15 minutes per case to answer the questions that the examiner has for you. One of the two cases will be a standardized clinical case scenario, and this will be provided by the National Board of Examination as a PowerPoint presentation with suggested questions and answers. Suggested question and answer because the National Board believes that there should be uniformity with regard to the questions which are asked to the students. And uh, this case again, like the OSCEs, will be common for all the candidates all over the country. All the centers will be having this PowerPoint uh, you know, presentation which will be uh, sent by the National Board of Examination from the Command Center. And there will be two examiners who will be sitting together uh, on the table and they will be examining the candidate simultaneously. However, both the examiners are asked to mark independently. It's not that they consult each other, okay, 10 out of 15 or, you know, whatever. So both the examiners will mark the, uh, give the marks independently. Case number two. One is, of course, by is, is the projected by the National Board of Examination. Case number two is 
is the choice of the convener or the coordinator of the examination uh, center where the examination is being conducted. Now, this is one clinical skills demonstration station as relevant for the specialty. Of course, for us, what would be most relevant is management of the airway or whether it is research station. Uh, you know, there may be a volunteer for demonstration of the skills. And if uh, there is one volunteer like that, the examiner might ask you to demonstrate how are you going to perform central venous cannulation in this patient? Show me the landmarks. Tell me where exactly where the needle, uh, you know, will be the entry point of the needle and what direction will be there. Or demonstrate how are you going to perform arterial cannulation on this patient? How are you going to perform brachial plexus in this patient, uh, brachial plexus block in this patient? Or how are you going to perform percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy or cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Uh, you know, for this, of course, uh, the, the, there'll be a mannequin over there or else for others, the examiners uh, can ask you that, okay, this is a patient, how are you going to do this? Please, uh, you know, describe the technique. Uh, this case will be arranged by the center, the coordinator of the center. And the candidate again will be examined, uh, examined simultaneously at both the stations. Uh, first as the standardized virtual case, which I told you, case one, and second, which will be the real clinical skill case. I'm giving you a case scenario, not of anesthesia, but for ethical reasons. And, uh, but I'll give you, a, you know, somewhat like uh, a case uh, from the neurology, just, an exam, just to give an idea of uh, what uh, it would be like. <clears throat> a 29-year-old woman presented with the following completes, cognitive impairment of six years, forgetfulness, six years duration, worsened over the last one and a half years with abnormal behavior. There's a repetition of words, irrelevant talk, crying and laughing for trivial reasons. There's difficulty in walking, the tendency to fall for the last four years. There is stiffness in all the four limbs. Two episodes of loss of consciousness in the past two years associated with sudden deviation of neck to the left side. So you have a lot of history which is available. Decreased vision for near and far objects for the last six months. Past personal family history is insignificant. The gross examination visual act, uh, of the cranial nerves is visual activity is 6 by 24 bilaterally. Extraocular movements are normal. Motor system, including cerebellum, you have the whole uh, you know, information that is necessary. Sensory examination, patient is able to appreciate touch and temperature. He is unable to cooperate for detailed evaluation. These are what the investigations look like. And these are further uh, views of the same patient. Now, thereafter, having given this much of information to the candidate, there is history available, there is examination, uh, physical examination of the patient which is available. And then, of course, uh, you have the images available. Now, the examiner is going to ask questions with regard to quite often is, uh, you know, what is the diagnosis? And what is, what is the basis on, on what you make this diagnosis? And how are you going to manage? This is a neurology uh, you know, example that I've given for uh, ethical reasons. I don't want to bring in NSEA question here. So you can imagine what sort of case scenario, the second case scenario that the local center can give you. It can either be a virtual case uh, like this, or it can be a real case where he may ask you to demonstrate something uh, practical, uh, you know, any, any procedure uh, practically. Well, friends, uh, I would like to summarize uh, familiarity with the process of examination is important uh, because once you are familiar, you are better prepared. Your performance is better. There is you, you are more confident to deal with the problem. There is clarity of the process and you are less likely to prone to errors. There's no confusion about it. The time utilization is important. You know that how much time you have and you have to give your best during that particular time. And of course, the outcome is pretty happy. And I wish you all my best. I wish you all the very best for your examination. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am sure that most of the students are going to view this uh, in the YouTube later on, and this yeah. is going to be a handbook for their preparation in the DNB examination. And uh, as uh, 
Dr. Vengadegiri said it's uh, um, for the most of the uh, students, the confusion was was with uh, regard to the ward rounds. Yeah. So how much uh, uh, one question is uh, before going to uh, comments from the many senior faculty here, Professor Mubarak is there. And uh, let me ask one question. How much time each uh, scenario of each uh, student can have in five the scenario minutes. session? In the five minutes. Five minutes, huh? five minutes for each uh, uh, ward round. Because the diagnosis is pretty obvious, uh, there is not much time that is being spent by the examiner in asking the candidate about the diagnosis because it is almost clear. So uh, he has to ask with regard to the NRCA management of that particular question. Okay, sir. Another question is that whether the students has to uh, take their uh, thesis or logbook uh, in the examination. No, logbook is not required in the examination center. Uh, if it is required by the national board, uh, you know, that is uh, different. But in the examination center, no student is required to bring the logbook or the thesis or whatever. Nothing. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, uh, let me invite to some comments from the senior sure. faculties of uh, Please Kerala, do. sir. Yep, yeah. Please Professor do. Mubarak is there. Mubarak, sir, can you unmute and uh, give your comments? He was because he's a senior faculty and uh, he was a regular examination examiner for the DNB program. We have been examiner together, uh, you know, few yeah, times. Yeah. Doctor uh, yeah. Doctor Gedu as well as uh, Doctor Mubarak. Hello, Doctor yeah. Mubarak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening, Belgi, sir. Good evening, Gedu, sir. Good evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Dr. Yeah. and actually, uh, Belgi, sir. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, good evening, sir. Good evening, okay, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have been yeah, together, yeah. three of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice to see all of our previous colleagues as examiners. Dr. Yeah, Bhimesh yeah. sir is there. Bhimesh yeah. sir is there. Yes, yeah. sir. Good evening, sir. And uh, actually, Belji sir was my first go examiner, and he was my teacher as a DNB examiner. Oh. In <laughs> that was that was my first DNB exam. Probably, I think it is. It was in 2010 or so. From mm -hmm. that time onwards, I was a regular examiner, and I was being co exam with the Gadu sir, Bhimesh sir, sir, and all many many times. So for the last three, ex I, I, I joined this uh, webinar only a little late. So I heard the last part of where this has talked. So for the last three exams, where, where the OSCE based exam was introduced, I was an examiner in all the three exams. And uh, the last exam has been modified to such an extent, uh, extent that the OSCE marks has been reduced. It has 25 questions of six marks. It was previously of eight marks. And, uh, and uh, the other, and the ward rounds has been introduced, introduced in the, in the current thing. So the change was, uh, previously it was 200 marks or so for the OSCE. Now it is 50%. So a candidate who does well in the OSCE, if he secures 100% marks in the OSCE, even if he gets zero in the other side, he will pass. There is no separate pass mark for the OSCE component and the practical component. So, uh, uh, but the OSCE, the standard of OSCE has been constantly raised from the first exam. It was very, very simple. And second exam, it was moderately Okay, and the last OSCE exam was, it was really case-based based, and it, just, it was not so easy, but the uh, overall result of the exam candidates was very good. I think more than 90% of the candidates has passed the exams. So the candidates, if they perform well in the OSCE, they can be very free, they can freely go for the practical without any tension because they already scored. If they score, an, av an average candidate can score about, around 100 marks in the OSCE. So, they need only 50 marks out of 150 to get a pass. And there is no first class or second class or distinction. So that is that is the uh, And the uh, practical aspects, the changes is ward rounds. Ward rounds, they have national board specifically instructed it should be re real cases and not case scenarios. And it, it, it is independently examined by four examiners of 10 marks. It's only a five minutes. So we give, uh, so how we did in our college, in our center, in my center was, we made four four center four station for each candidate. One was all pre-anesthetic patient, for example, post patient post for a thyroid surgery or a breast surgery or whatever it is. Pre-operative patients with preferably with an obvious diagnosis like a thyroid swelling or and with an eye, eye, eye problem at a cataract. Such patients were put as one one case. And the second uh, was a post-operative. We, we took one examiner to the, to the recovery room. Uh, soon after the patient comes after surgery to the, to the recovery room. So uh, that is, a, for example, patient after trap surgery coming for a, uh, coming to a recovery room or after thyroid surgery coming. So immediate post-operative uh, cases in the recovery room was, was a second case. These were real cases. And third case, we went to ICU. One of the examiners were in the ICU. We were in the beds. beds. 
with uh, patients like a tracheostomy patient or a post operative patient or third day fourth day like that that was a icu case was the third third patient and the fourth patient was was volunteers volunteers means we had our staff who had a thyroid swelling who had some other problem who had undergone a lap colostectomy so these were the five cases five four stations for each examiners and the national board has given only 5 minutes and for so we don't go to the case detail we give the patient candidates diagnosis or, or the spotter and ask the post, the relevant things or the examiner can decide what what has to be assessed in 5 minutes either to to demonstrate a, a sign for example if i give in a thyroid case you can't go to the full details in 5 minutes either they can ask to elicit the how do you assess the the tremor in the tongue and in the hands or how do you exam demonstrate me how do you exam the thyroid swelling whether from the back or this thing or what are the eye signs a few points only or what are the post operative complaints something like that so the examiner can select one area and only ask regarding that so with, uh, so we have to stick, strictly follow time guidelines of 5 minutes that's how we did the ward rounds in four stations with real all were real patients as per the national board guidelines we are not supposed to give any dummy or scenario or this for this ward round that is a must in this case and the second case and second was viva stations as that was there was no change the, the as previously we were doing in four stations that also was 5 minutes per candidate so we can't go uh, for example in, in the investigation we have to ask x ray ecg abg capnograph pft everything we cannot ask for 5 minutes so either we we take one of the for example take one x ray and talk for a 2 3 minutes on that take one ecg or you can't have all the items for one candidate because of time limit so either you can either that, that is left to examine whether they they take all the things or stick to one one or two like like that then the third, then then the other stations were anesthesia machines and circuits then the third station was resuscitation at all previous then the fourth one was communication skills research methodology recent advances that does not so in that on within the five minutes time frame whatever the examiner can ask so the, the time frame was very constricted that was the problem that was the, how we did and the last part of that was the 70 marks of practice in the afternoon session was as the sir told one was a standard uh, case given by the senior by the national board and for that we have only 15 minutes so we have so we can go to a certain extent we cannot go to elaborate discussion on any on any of this and the other thing was the the liberty of the can of the sender whether to put a real patient or a volunteer or a scenario based or a dummy based so we did it in a dummy based this thing we we since we have, we we made an obstetric patient with a full uh, full full stomach in a dummy and uh, and a pediatric patient or dummy also we kept since the question was an obstetric we made that uh, obstetric we made to an ascites and we, we changed to jaundice of some hot life attention immediately since when when the question came so all the, the the standard things were done this was this was how i done and i think i have a few suggestions to belgi sir probably belgi sir can take it to national board uh, then the osk could have been reduced to some 10 questions or 15 questions to reduce and this because the practical parts we are having very less of Uh, marks so only no, no, previously it was more 200 plus 100 now it is at least 50 50 but if the uh, osk time is reduced and the osk questions questions are good 10 or 15 questions with some with a uh, lesser marks uh, percentage of marks of the osk we can have more more time and more questions for the practical things for that for example for a ward rounds the yeah, ward how, how can you examine or how can you ask the candidate in five minutes when the candidate comes and breathes and get to ad, adapt to that environment itself it takes five minutes by the time the bell rings and he has to go out so the ward round should be at least 10 minutes and the and the other thing why why it's okay we are doing it so at least 10 minutes we need for ward round for one case and that ward round session is very good i think a national board can uh, uh, dedicate like this one should be a pre op case one should be a post recovery room one should be an icu one should be a volunteer the pattern which i did i think if the others agree to it it can be made a standard or some standard can be made such so that you can go to all the areas that is one another such a suggestion then regarding the practical scenario also 15 minutes for a case discussion is also i think it's very uh, previously we used to get 30 minutes without 15 minutes we can assess only the, because the last time the case given was a mitral regurgitation patient an obstetric patient with mitral regurgitation that was okay so when we are when we concentrate on a multi system cases 
like that we, we, with 15 minutes we can concentrate on only one aspect or a theory and many and the scenario given was quite confusing and most 99 percent of the students was telling it as mitosinosis so it should be there were uh, on the scenario was um, a little confusing also so the candidates so we, it took time for the candidates to we get to correct the diagnosis and all so if the, that also has some 20 to 30 minutes that also would have been better so these two times for the ward rounds and the case scenario ward rounds to, to five to ten minutes either you can reduce to two cases ward rounds if the time limit permits instead of four but better will be 10 minutes or four like that then the war then the case discussion 15 minutes also too short at least 20 minutes or preferably 30 minutes so those two time frames can be taken by reducing the OSCE component may, may maybe a 10 or 15 questions will be that is like a theory exam only so this is practical. We have to uh, talk to a candidate and the examiner extracts the uh, knowledge of the candidate. So reducing the OSCE component to one hour or so with the, with and shed, and rescheduling the March schedule also. Probably a hundred marks for uh, OSCE component and a two hundred marks for a practical component in this scheme would be a better balance. I feel. So these are some my suggestions and my a few things. I think well, this, uh, uh, yeah. uh, I would like to uh, say very, very briefly, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mubarak. Uh, very good points that you have said. <clears throat> With regard to the uh, introduction of ward rounds, uh, Dr. Mubarak has very clearly said, earlier it used to be 200 marks, and many students would get uh, close to, say, 150 marks. So even if they are not doing anything good on the other side, they still would get through because the candidate was required to have only 150 marks. The introduction of ward rounds are based on this only because give them a diagnosis or a very clear clue with regard to the diagnosis of the patient and ask about the anesthetic management of that patient. So that was the first thing that was uh, that the national board thought to test the practical knowledge and the skill of the candidate and, and his own application of that knowledge. So that was the concept of the ward rounds. Now, with regard to the time, uh, it is five minutes. Five minutes specifically kept because the diagnosis to the candidate is quite obvious. He doesn't need to make any effort to make a diagnosis. The examiner is to ask only the anesthetic management by and large, nothing more than that. Now, if we uh, you know, have uh, increased time, your, your point is very valid, sir. Five minutes is too less. I fully agree with you. But let's imagine that, you know, bar rounds, only four candidates can be examined at given time. So four candidates examined, that means 20 minutes for that particular round for, of, for those only four candidates. Now, if we increase the time from five minutes, it would mean five to 10 minutes. It would mean an addition of at least one and one and one and a half hours to the total time of the examination. Now, with the prevailing situation of COVID pandemic, the National Board thought that let's have a quick assessment of the candidate's knowledge and uh, you know uh, his, his uh, intelligence with regard to the management of anesthesia. Unlike in the theory paper, where you know the candidate is given particular conscious, uh, uh, particular questions, and with his knowledge, he will just write down on the paper that this, this is how it is. That is what OSCE was all about. So they want to test the practical knowledge of the candidate. So that's why the ward round was introduced. OSCE, uh, the, the marking of the OSCE was reduced. Well, yes, with regard to uh, your suggestion that, uh, you know, uh, OSCE can be further reduced, uh, I probably would be going to the National Board next week for some work. And uh, I'll, I'll put forward that point. With regard to the reduction of the ward rounds from four to two, it's quite possible that, you know, the two cases or the, the ward round, uh, you know, patient that the candidate is given to, uh, to, to answer from, that may be his strong area. So he may uh, get through. I mean, I'm not uh, going to be harsh on the students, but the point is, if the candidate is given four different type of patients, and then you test the candidate, you can assess the candidate more comprehensively with regard to his knowledge and his application of that knowledge, rather than giving two, uh, you know, two two uh, ward rounds to that uh, that candidate and increase the time. But yes, your uh, suggestion is well taken, and um, whenever I get an opportunity, 
to uh, to talk to the national board of examination seniors i will put those points forward thank you so much for your very very uh, well thought of uh, you know uh, comments and uh, i'm sure i've been able to convey what exactly is there but yes i'll take up these questions with the national Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. We'll go to comments from the another uh, other senior faculty members. Professor Gurudev sir is there. Pro yeah. Professor Philip, Professor Arama, uh, Professor Kamishar Rao. The B major is there. The Gurudev sir. Gurudev sir. Uh, sir, I think Gurudev left. Professor sir left just now. Uh, Dr. Shabha Philip, she is a senior faculty in from Kerala. Dr. Shabha Philip, Dr. Sarama, I think uh, they can unmute and uh, give their comments. They have DNB students. They have a good number of DNB students. Okay, Kerala is there, Rajesh? I uh, think no, Ramda, uh, they uh, can uh, be. Ramda sir is not there. They can be one thing. Uh, uh, you know, to save time. we can go ahead with the next presentation and i'll sit through the whole program so at then yeah. in case there are still uh, questions left I, i'll be too happy to uh, answer that i'll sit through the whole program don't worry yes, sir thank you sir so that will just to save time and the students can post their comments in the chat sure, box sure they can they please and, please uh, feel free to do that yeah and uh, students please cool. note uh, next week's program there's uh, anesthesia breathing circuits and the drugs in anesthesia part 2 mm -hmm. we had part 1 before which was uh, oh, well appreciated by the video. students and uh, oh, again there is a request from students to have another couple of more sessions and uh, uh, dr sanish and uh, dr mohammed abdul nazar is coming in the next week with uh, the second part and uh, with uh, along with the two students dr piyas hamzat and dr fatima sana and uh, of course uh, from uh, anesthesia in breathing circuits by dr babraj a senior faculty from kerala Uh, over to Dr. Vijish for the next uh, session. Yeah. Please note the WhatsApp. Uh, if any of your friends has not joined for the PG update, please send a message to uh, this number, WhatsApp message, and uh, your name and college. Over to Dr. Vijish. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening. We move on to the next session. and the next session will be uh, by dr r p gedu who is professor and head of the department of anesthesiology at dy patil medical college navi mumbai he is a uh, he is going to talk on retrograde and blindness intubation there will be a video demonstration he is a master in airway management and over to you sir over to gedu sir for his uh, <laughs> Gedu sir, please unmute and start. Yeah, I unmuted already. Don't worry. I'm just going just. And anyway, again, once again, thanks to all Kerala branch people. And before I really start showing those videos which I already sent to them, I would like to share some important things which are the prerequisite before we really commit for the either blind nasal or the retrograde intubation. the thing is it is very vital important thing to for us to basically anesthetize the oropharynx and even uh, part above the uh, uh, cords and below the cords these are very important parts and this we are actually this has been taught to me in tata memorial hospital which i practiced a lot where uh, we normally used to come across all the oropharyngeal malignancies right from ca mandible to ca tongue to all the maxilla base of the tongue and everything so in all those cases i have done it a lot maybe more than 5 600 i have done these uh, retrograde intubations in fact even uh, when i was in tata and even now in dy patil whenever they need uh, to learn this thing because in dy patil they never saw it earlier but once i entered i started teaching all of them so they are very happy for that so these are the prerequisite which we really want to go that we have to give a proper anesthesia to the patients before we really go ahead with these things so what we normally do is we give a topical anesthesia as far as anesthesia is concerned to the oropharynx and that is a very essential part and for these reasons we have to give 
uh, nebulization of the 4% lignocaine 4 ml using a Hansen mask and a nebulizer as it is being shown in this picture over here. And this we do at least about 15 to 25 minutes before the procedure. We bring the patient in the pre-anesthesia checkup room or in the recovery. And there we put the patient in this uh, nebulization. And once the nebulization is uh, completed, we take the patient in the operation theater and thereafter we put the 2% lignocaine jelly in both the nostrils and, and after that it's very important and vital to check the patency of the each nostril which is very important either that can be checked with the feeling of the expiratory flow this was in the old days we used to do this but with the present problems of the corona and covid better to have a to insert a soft nasal airways in each nostril to just check it out which one is patent so that it is going to help us very much as far as the procedure is concerned once this thing has been done thereafter we must it is very essential for us to know which are the important nerve supply which we are going to block so though the books mentioned glossopharyngeal nerve i never used to practice for the glossopharyngeal nerve block to be honest but the main nerves which was concerned for us was the superior laryngeal nerve which basically supplies all the parts above the cords, that is from the oropharynx to the vocal cord level. While the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is supplying to the parts below the cord, right from below the cord up to the carina. So these two things has to be done. The anesthesia has to be given. So how it is to be done? So this is the one for the superior laryngeal nerve block, what was done, as you can see in the picture over here. So what we do is first thing, sorry, first thing we palpate, the uh, Adam's apple, then you start going up, up slowly till we, I mean, we first we go laterally so that we can feel the greater corner. Once we create, feel the greater corner of the thyroid uh, cartilage, thereafter we go a little up. And in quite a few people, you may feel the higher, or sometimes it is very difficult to feel, doesn't matter. But normally, what we do is once we feel it over here, as you can see over here or even here it has been shown, the diagram has been shown. This has been shown even in the video when I'm doing this in the retrograde intubation. So here what we do, we insert it when after, of course, uh, proper assertive precaution. We inform the patient also beforehand that you are going to be given the injection over the neck. This is basically because you've got a limited mouth opening. And before that, we have to anesthetize you and thereafter only we put the tube and then we will give anesthesia. So we prepare the patient beforehand. We make him mentally stable for this. And thereafter, I don't prefer to give any laxative. I mean, sorry, any sedation or anything. I just give at the most atropine or glycopyrrolate. I honestly don't prefer to give sedation unless the patient is very agitated, uncooperative. Then I don't mind giving even 25 uh, fentanyl and uh, one or two medazola. Otherwise, Normally, I what I do after cleaning and all, insert a 25 gauge needle, 0.5 centimeter, inframedial, that is from over here, the greater cornu of the higher bone from here to the just about 0.5 centimeter uh, below inframedially. And once we insert over here, thereafter, what we do is we just put the needle over here about 0.5 centimeter inside. And thereafter, we always negative aspiration for blood and air. Because if you do a negative, I mean, if you get a chance air, that means you have crossed the larynx and you have entered the laryngeal uh, cavity. And if you get the blood, of course, there are vessels over there. So you are entering, your local anesthetic will be entering into the blood. So that is very important for us to know that we are giving negative aspiration. Once that has been done, what I do is I fan out the spread of the local anesthetic around like this, as I can show over the pointer over here. So over here on the either side, that is on both sides of the uh, cornu of the uh, higher bone, we do this injection. And this technique is to be done on both sides. And this, the main, of course, aim is to block the areas above the level of the vocal cords. As you can see over here also, that is being done over here. So this is your thyroid, and this is your uh, cornu of the higher, and, and of course, this is your trichothyroid membrane. And the second block is, of course, the transthracheal one. The main aim of the transthracheal is basically to give the local anesthesia to the uh, below the cord level up to the carina. So here, of course, 
<clears throat> once we enter the truck, the yeah, patient will cough out and we welcome the cough because this coughing will definitely help us to spread the drug uniformly across the thing. So here what we do, we first palpate the cricothyroid membrane, which again, initially we palpate the Adam's apple. Once the Adam's apple is palpated, we slowly press down. So once we start pressing down, thereafter, I'm sorry. Once we start pressing down, we will feel there is a small depression coming, which is basically a soft, spongy, fibromuscular type of thing. So it is not a cartilaginous structure. And just about a couple of millimeters below that comes our uh, cricoid cartilage. So in between this thyroid and cricoid cartilage, as shown over here in this red mark. So this is where initially I gave a point five ml of the local anesthetic, that is maybe 2% lignocaine. And this I do not at the straight perpendicular, I go initially horizontal because afterwards I'm going to insert for the retrograde intubation uh, uh, but, uh, to his needle and all. So that is the reason we need to have a local anesthetic at, at the skin level. Once that is being done thereafter, at the center, what I do, I just, as it has been shown in this picture over here, I hold the trachea with both the hands so that the trachea doesn't move on the sides. And after that, that is, I stabilize the larynx by holding by both the hands. And thereafter, I pass, say, either 18 or 16 gauge to the needle right in the center with about 4 ml of the 2% lignocaine. Initially in the perpendicular direction, but again, go very slowly. Otherwise, we may enter something, go beyond the trachea and we may enter into the esophagus. So that is not acceptable. We should not be so much advantage advancing so fast. So we go slowly in the perpendicular and uh, continuously go on aspirating till we get the air bubbles. Once we get air bubbles, that means we are in the tracheal lumen. So after this, once I reach over there, since I'm, my target is going to the upward direction, cephalite direction, so I make the needle about 20 to 30 degrees angle cephalite. And after that, I inject about 3 to 4 ml of the lignocaine, 2% lignocaine. And here, as I already told you, patient coughing is very vital for me as this is a very good, it tells me also that I'm in the right place, as well as it tells me that the spread of the local anesthetic is very much. So here my area to anesthetize is just below the cord. So I think once this is been done, I think now Benil will show you, start showing you the videos. Benil, you can start. Yeah, Benil. I already sent Benil it's a, the wait. videos. Yes. Yes. Now, initially, I actually wanted the blind laser, but thereafter, I told him because so that the local anesthesia technique will be shown properly. Longer video is there that is of the retrograde intubation. So that is what I told him to show first the retrograde intubation. Here I also showed you the technique how I used to anesthetize the oropharynx as well as the cords and all those things. So I think uh, Benil is taking a little bit of time. For retrograde intubation actually there are three different techniques which are being used. One is retrograde, second is retrograde anterograde and sec third is we can just uh, railroad the other thing also. But more importantly, as I can show over here is the main one. I think uh, he has started. No. Well, in this, what I have shown in this video before he starts the video, I think I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah, You're there he has started. Yeah. yeah. I think he has started the things. This is not the one. I think next one comes. Yes, start the video, please. So here, this is a Tata Hospital uh, patient. As you can see, no, I think he's going further. Yeah, there we start. Retrograde intubation. I'll also talk the same, uh, what is there in the video scene. What happened? It was started and stopped. Benil, 
Sir, I hope it's visible. No, nothing is visible. Okay. No, but I think it has just jumped on the other side. No. It's okay. It's visible now. But you said start from the first. I think it is in between you have started. No, I have started retrograde intubation. Yeah, now from here you start. Correct. Okay. Start. No, it's, it's running, sir. I hope others no, are... Weak. Here, no, at yes, least it, it is, is not visible. seen in the screen. It is visible. Visible for us, sir. Mm -hmm. oh, I can't see the video, honestly. I can just see one picture, but I'm not able to see the video. Dr. Gedu, it is being seen. Uh, it must be some setting uh, uh, which may... Uh, okay, but I can't see it from here. Okay, fine. I don't know what's the problem. Okay, you people are able to see, then it's fine. But only thing, yeah. my talk will not be able to coordinate with the video because I can't see the video. But the thing is, what I'm trying to show is this video is being started after the nebulization has been done. And what we are showing over here is first, initially we showed the, uh, what you call, how we feel the superior laryngeal nerve block to be given on the either side of the uh, higher cornu. And thereafter, what I can see over here is the right in the center at the cricothyroid membrane. The local anesthetic is given horizontally. And after that is being done, right in the center, once the trachea is being stabilized, I put the uh, two his needle and this two his needle. And of course, negative aspiration is going to be there till I get the uh, air bubbles, which shows that I am very much into the trachea. And thereafter, since I want my direction of the catheter to go upward, that is cephalic direction, so I give the direction. So I give the direction, uh, turn the needle direction cephalic a little bit 20, 30 degrees. And the purpose of using the 2E needle, of course, you may be thinking why I'm using 2E needle. Because it is one thing, it is blunt, and second thing, it has got a what you call the huber point. So the direction of the catheter will go automatically cephalic. So once it has been gone, as you can see over here, again, in, it has come in the pieces. I'm not saying I'm getting it cut, cut pieces in between. On. So here, what I do, once this catheter goes into the oral cavity, the normally patient tells that there is a thread coming in the oral cavity. Then we tell him either he can pull out, if there is no lesion on the tongue, he can pull out with the tongue. If he can't, then also we can just see, remember this patient, what he's been shown, had hardly one centimeter mouth opening. So I didn't pass the laryngoscope, I neither pass anything. From the light at the head, or head on light, I'll just put the uh, Magil's forcep and I'll catch hold of the catheter and I'll bring out the catheter. And since it has come out of the oral cavity, thereafter I'll put another rubber, red rubber catheter, a smaller size, maybe a red rubber catheter from the nostril. And then once it enters the oropharynx, the patient again tells, yeah, it has come in the oropharynx. It is just troubling or rather irritating me in the oral cavity. Thereafter, again, I pass the Magus forcep and I pull out that. And thereafter, through the hole of this uh, red rubber, just tie the knot with this uh, uh, epidural catheter. And then I pull it out, the epidural catheter, through the nostril. Once that is being pulled out, thereafter, it has been established very well. Of course, the needle is being removed by then. And thereafter, I hold the catheter and that is one end is coming out from the nostril, second end is coming out from the, uh, what you call the neck, that is at the cricoid level. I hold it in a bow fashion so that the catheter doesn't get either kinked or circled or twisted. So it is held in the bow fashion like the way it is endotracheal tube. And thereafter, I uh, take the endotracheal tube, that is the portex endotracheal tube, which is a little smaller one, size seven and a half, eight number. We will not take the cut to cut size a little 1.5 uh, centimeter smaller size. And once that is being taken, we just put that uh, through the Murphy's eye of the endotracheal tube. We just thread the catheter and through the Murphy's eye, bring it into the lumen of the catheter. And then I lumen of the endotracheal tube and then, then we get it out from the proximal end instead of the distal end is already at the Murphy's eye. Once that is being done, then through the nostril, which is patent, we put this tube 
endotracheal tube and once that is being going near the cords sometime patient do cough or sometime he just blocks i mean holds the cord tight in that condition it is not easy but otherwise normally we can get it in within one or two attempt we can get it and once the tube is inside as you can see over here the tube has gone inside once the tube is inside we do confirm the tube of course we remove the catheter either from the oral end i mean from the endotracheal tube end or we can take out also from the uh, required end we can just take it out and once that is been done we attach the breathing circuit and we confirm it either by the movement of the bag which is also telling that tube is very much placed in the respiratory tract or by looking at the etcu2 once the etcu2 is coming we are sure that tube is perfectly placed and remember with all those things as you can show here see over here the i can i am holding the reservoir bag and here you can see the even the it is here to coming so once that is been done we confirm and we fix and then we just check the air entry and thereafter we give the anesthesia either by thiopentone propofol and then we give the relaxant this is of course we inflate the cuff and that is how we start with the retrograde anesthesia uh, intubation and let me tell you it, of course we need a practice for this it's not that easy but after practicing i must tell you i finish this retrograde intubation in 3 to 4 minutes i finish it well in the good old days i also uh, as i told you i was putting the epidural catheter but of late i have started putting the small that is the guide wire which has been used for the pcnl and all by the uro surgeons or the cardiac catheter people so this metallic guide wire also can be used the advantage of metallic guide wire is two one thing is the guide metallic guide wire normally i can say almost 60 70% time it straight away comes out from the nostril so that is much more easier for us to go with the metallic guide wire and then it is very easy for us to thread the uh, endotracheal tube also so this is the way i conduct the retrograde intubation now we come to the blind as an intubation when is playing sir just say start the blind nasal unfortunately i can't see here the videos to be very sorry but thankfully you people are seeing the videos yes yes we are seeing it very much blind nasal intubation as far as blind nasal is concerned see this is the one again to show you and see this is also as you can see over here a tata logo is there so this was all done in tata memorial the blind nasal of course pre operative preparation as i was telling you the topical anesthesia is same as it been done earlier as i have shown you only thing over here is once the tube is been put inside we straight away after giving the local anesthesia and all we follow blast that is coming from the nasal cavity only difference is as you can see over here uh, with the gauze pieces we block all the that is oral cavity and the second nostril still also so that patient doesn't have any other option to breathe except to breathe from the endotracheal tube so this is what it is been shown that he was feeling it directly onto the ear the blast and sound is coming and this was done by one of my very senior professor one respected blind nasal man that is dr kaila sharma also he was also and after he i was the only one who used to do all this blind nasal and let me tell you this which video what is been shown he finished the blind nasal in less than 30 seconds it is done so beautifully only thing as i told you earlier with the covid days it is not easy there are some people who also suggest can i attach the etco2 directly so that on the screen directly if i am entering the vocal cord i can see the etco2 coming but that's not a 100% true technique for the simple reason that even if you are around the vocal cord or patient is coughing out you will still get a small amount of the etco2 waves coming so it is not a very good one so normally instead of that what we do normally is nowadays i don't see feel it with the blast coming from the ear i mean i am hearing it from the ear but nowadays i either see the humidification that is coming out into the endotracheal tube 
or I just put the palm, which is of course with the glows, so I can feel the blast coming. So that is the direction which tells you, see here it's showing with the ears. So now see how it has just walked inside. So this is what we used to do regularly, even today I'm doing that only. Not, of course, with this COVID days, I'm not using the blast to be heard in the ear, but I put it on the glows where you can make out the blast or even you can see the humidification around the endotracheal tube coming that is over here. So the expired ear comes out with a humidification also. So these are the two techniques. And of course, to confirm this, you confirm it with the bag movement that is occurring with the inspiration and expiration, and as well as with the ATSO2 wave that is been coming. So these are the techniques we routinely do. I mean, as far as I was just talking to Binil earlier also, that in my theater, in Tata Memorial, there is hardly used to say, Dr. Gidu's theater, na, he doesn't need fiber optic. He will do all this as a retrograde. So that is what I used to do regularly, even in Tata Memorial, DY Patil. Maybe I can say only five or 10% time to teach the student I use fiber optic. But I do these techniques, blind nasal or S. Any questions, please? Vinil. Vinil, question time. There is no questions in the chat box, I, I can say. But, uh, welcome to the questions uh, from the senior faculties and the students. In the era yes. of uh, fiber optic uh, uh, intubation techniques, uh, the blind nasal and retrograde intubation has taken a back seat, but still it has got a relevance because uh, on the morning of surgery, your no, FOB may not work. No, but I must tell you one thing. This is a favorite question of all the examiners whenever there is a difficult intubation question. I mean, uh, case comes. We always say one thing that in your institute, there is no fiber optic. What will you do? Because fiber optic has made your life so easy that the students have forgotten the other techniques. So I always ask this question that if there is no fiber optic, what options you have got? You must know also what is blind nasal. You must know also what is retrofit. Any yes, anybody? So comments from the senior faculties. Uh... Excellent presentation, Gedo. Yeah. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Dr. Gedo. Yeah, Kameshwar. Kameshwar Garu. Ah, good evening, everyone. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. Very good evening, Dr. Kameshwar Garu. Sir, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gedo. A nice presentation. And this is very important thing what you have stressed. Uh, because every center will not have this fiber optic facility. And uh, it requires training also. And uh, it's not possible in every place. And our anesthesiologists are going to remote places Let and... Uh, uh, they should uh, understand this uh, basic technique. This me, I insist in my classes. Yeah. <laughs> this, Let me tell I, you, I, I passed from a place where there was no fiber optic till I left Shilapur. <laughs> that means till 1990, <laughs> there was no fiber optics available there, even till 1995. I don't know the present situation. So there are many small government institutes or private institutes where there is no fiber optic available. So that doesn't mean a student should always master this technique. Or, see, in private hospital, many in the Mumbai also, imagine Bombay is such a hi-fi area. But still in small private hospitals, there also they say, if you want a fiber optic, you get your own fiber optic. Correct. I don't have fiber optic. Correct, correct. And so one I, thing, I, I suggest one thing also for the youngster, to carry a 14 gauze uh, intracath needle, they puncture tricotar head, take out the needle, the catheter end, if they connect a 2cc syringe and uh, remove the barrel of the, plunger of the syringe to the barrel, if you connect a 7.5 mm uh, endotracheal tube adapter, the other end you can connect the 22 mm of the circuit of uh, Megil, uh, this uh, pain circuit or uh, uh, Maples and app, and you can uh, give oxygen by pumping, and that can save many yeah. lives. That simple kit they carry that I use it to carry during my practice days. That also I suggest to youngsters. No, so, so I must tell you one thing. Now we have modified this technique also a little bit, in which case what happens is we take it a little more safety nowadays. Once we put this uh, catheter inside, metallic catheter, I mean, metal guide wire, thereafter, 
through the nostril only we put a cook's tube exchanger hmm. once the cook's tube exchanger goes right up to your vocal cord and it goes beyond there after we remove the guide wire so that at least there is one cook cook's tube exchanger also there which is a airway device through which i can give in case the worst thing saturation goes down i can give a jet ventilation through that also and maintain the things and on that cook cook tube exchanger also we can railroad the endotracheal tube yeah. so that is a little more safer thing that has come up well that was not the thing which was earlier available yeah Malji ji. Yes, yeah, I'm. I'm watching beautiful video that you made. Very good presentation of so both the uh, topics that you had, uh, the blind nasal as well as uh, the you know retrograde. Uh, these are the techniques. You are perfectly right in saying that with the fiber optic coming, most of the uh, you know seen uh, apart from most of the seniors, uh, I don't think youngsters are really adapting to this. They stayed with go ahead with the fiber optic one. and they are losing this uh, the, the very important art of intubating a patient when the fiber optic is not available i remember uh, just like that you showed that one of your seniors uh, who was there in tata memorial how smoothly had he put the tube in very smoothly he went in and you said that uh, he could do yes, it yes. within uh, 20 30 seconds right whereas uh, uh, you know uh, it's, it's, it's a technique that needs some bit of uh, skill Uh, with which you do it, and with the COVID there, and mm -hmm. uh, you are perfectly right that uh, you know you don't listen to the sounds now because uh, there is a lot of risk, uh, you know, because of the COVID. So you 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 see the yeah. moisture which is appearing in that. I think that's another safety feature that you have. But yes, uh, youngsters must learn this technique. You never know when you need it. Fiber optic may not oh. be available everywhere. You may not be working in the best of the institution every time. If you are working there, you have good luck. But Uh, still the technique should be uh, should not be forgot both the techniques no no let me tell you in tata memorial also we did have fiber optic but the worst part was in tata memorial amongst all the theaters at least two three theaters at a time had a difficult intubation so in some or the other theater the fiber optic was in the use yeah. so i cannot just make wait for the fiber optic because mm. the fiber optic comes and then it has to be sterilized it has to be cleaned and thereafter okay. i'll take it i'm not Next going time. to do that i said yes i tell you one thing in i still remember in one of my place where i did my md sholapur mm. how this mm. technique mastering is important we had a patient i always quoted in one of the my lectures which became very popular that is my journey in anesthesia mm. in this condition i must quote we had one patient a, a 14 year old guy coming with a big uh, adamantinum of the left mandible no oh. now it was so big it was intraoral also and he was a son of a police inspector oh and in sholapur we didn't have fiber optic so they thought that i think the intubation should not be difficult etc so initially i must confess to you that time i was a uh, third poster doing md so oh. so all of us right from me to the hod Everybody try to give thiopentone, scolene, thiopentone, scolene, dual laryngoscopy. None of them could intubate. Let me be honest. We tried for almost 45-50 minutes. No. Oh. And that time, they initially thought of tracheostomy, but then they said, "Oh my God, he is a son of a police inspector. How can we do that?" We had one person that was called Dr. Kulkarni, N. S. Kulkarni. I don't know if he is there or not, but very senior person. He was an honorary to us. And can you believe he was a master of open drop anesthesia in those days? Oh, open drop for him. Even if I am going surgery, he will give me also open drop. At this age, he was a master of that. So they immediately started searching for him, but he was busy in one private clinic outside. So can you believe this patient was postponed for that reason? That I think instead of tracheostomy, we will wait for any school guy to come tomorrow and let's see what he does. He said, "Okay, I'll do tomorrow. Whatever I can." Next day morning, he came. The patient was taken inside. He believe it or not, he gave the open drop. He gave ethyl chloride followed by ether. That took three minutes. After the three minutes, he put a blind nasal tube in less than thirty-five seconds. Oh, we fought for forty-five minutes to fifty minutes, and he finished in thirty-five forty seconds. And thereafter, he said, 
I think now you can manage. I have got outside work. I'm going. <laughs> so this yes. is what is important that you have to master your technique. Quite right. Quite right. I, I agree. I always say that. Hmm. Quite right. Our uh, professor Amar Raja was uh, used to do blind nasal with uh, either, depending under either anesthesia, because at that yeah, time. Yeah, that he did. Yeah. At that time, there was no uh, LMA, no um, uh, FOB, no... Nothing was there. You are absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. That, that was I tell you, when I was also doing my, even when I was doing my MD anesthesia during that, in my ENT operation theater, we were being told that all ENT patients will be intubated by uh, under open drop anesthesia only. And normally, we used to try their blind nasal. After blind nasal, we used to put laryngoscope and do the throat pack. So that is how we mastered, to be very honest. They do, sir. Both of your videos were very, very nice, very, very informative. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, though it was not visible for you, it, it was visible for all of us. I yeah. know, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm telling you, I was surprised that how it was so visible to you because I could not see anything. I could see just tit bits. It was very nice. Doesn't matter. I only sent Binil yesterday the video. And of course, I told Benil also, if they, if you really want, anytime in come in Kerala, and if there is a problem like that, I will show the how it is being done retrograde also. So COVID has kept you out of from Kerala, no? Otherwise, you you were a freaking visitor to Kerala. <laughs> See, as long as I tell you one thing, Nazar, Babarak, Benil, all these friends are there. I think Kerala is my home ground. Oh. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. No doubt about that. Beautiful place. Okay. Anyway. I always admire Kerala and its academic area. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And the uh, end of the next week's program, uh, the anesthesia for breathing circuits by Dr. Braburaj and uh, part two of the drugs in anesthesia by Dr. Sanish and uh, uh, Dr. E.K. Uh, Mohammed Abdul Nazar. So, over to Dr. Binil for the concluding remarks. Thank you for both faculties. It, uh, uh, Professor Gedu and uh, hello. Baljit Singh. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Professor, can hear you. Yeah, 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 Baljit Singh and Professor Baljit Singh and uh, Professor Gedu. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh, one, you, one minute. Uh, Baljit Singh, sir, was telling if there is any clarification or anything, we'll, we'll tell him that towards and Is there any queries or yeah, anything? If there's any query, well, I'm there. Uh, there's no queries, sir. Uh, but I have, I have uh, my suggestion to Baljit, sir. Uh, my suggestion to Baljit, sir, is uh, try to reduce, if, if you can just in, convince the National Board to reduce the OSCE to 100 marks and Practical side to 200 marks. I've and, yeah, made by yeah. notes. Whatever okay. has been said, I've made by okay. notes. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. I've Thank written you, sir. everything. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Sir. Well, Jeet, you are very prompt. Oh, no. Well, <laughs> uh, friends like uh, you or Dr. Mubarak say something. I think it's an order. <laughs> Thank you. I, I tell you, it was a real pleasure. We three were examiners in Chandigarh for That's true. PDI. PGI yes, 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 yes. That's right. I think YK Batra was there with us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Hmm. I remember. Yeah. Thank there you, Richard Giri. There, there is, sorry, uh, but I can see in the chat box is uh, Dr. Sneesh has asked, is, uh, it seems ICU ventilator was asked during the war rounds. Uh, I'm not too sure of this. Uh, uh, I don't think ICU ventilator is, a, is uh, to be asked in that particular round. Ward round is with the real patients and not with the, with the devices or the monitors or the ventilators. Patients are seen. They have a very obvious diagnosis <clears throat> so that the candidate, candidate doesn't have uh, any difficulty in, in, in uh, making a guess of what. And uh, the examiner is to ask with regard to the NSCI management. And the uh, ICU ventilator probably... Uh, I mean, uh, I think Dr. Sinish also is not sure, but ICU ventilator doesn't go into that part rooms. It right. goes anywhere else in the equipment or whatever. 
sir if we if we have patient on 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 ventilator it is possible that that can be asked also no? that's right patient yeah. on ventilator can be asked well yes yeah. you know but yeah, if, if, anything if can a... be asked with regard to yeah. say ventilator yeah. pneumonia or whatever yeah. you know yeah suppose suppose that in, the, can be asked. In, in the recovery room a patient is on ventilator in the post operative room or in the ICU, icu scenario it, it is possible sir no but yeah, yeah they can ask about the they can ask about yeah. the modes of ventilation and ventilator related problems you are absolutely right but the mm -hmm. national board uh, uh, does uh, suggest that the patients who are very sick should not be included mm -hmm. in the examination process because yes. obviously you cannot shift them and then in that case the student has to be shifted there and for yeah. reasons of health and security uh, it's not a very wise idea to take the student also in the icu because it will take a lot of time he will have to change then he will have to have a look examine the case a little bit and then come out uh so that's not a, a good suggestion but yes certainly uh, not the icu ventilator for the uh, ward rounds and in the, in in case of uh, some icu patient uh, who is uh, somewhat better safe uh, it, it can be included but national board i, I still feel that doesn't encourage uh, such a patients to be included in the exam Sir, in the viva station, in, in the equipment part also, you can you can ask in along with the anesthesia machines, you can ask about. Yes, you can ask anything about when, ventilators, yeah, monitors, yeah, ventilators. anything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, that, yeah, can yeah. Be that, that can be done. That can be done, be done yeah. of course. It is in that uh, particular segment, not for ward rooms. I just think, sir, uh, there was no uniformity. It seems uh, in the last time there was a lot of confusion, and uh, many of the students yeah. were uh, giving us feedbacks, and that's uh, why particularly this session was held. Actually, yes. students across India, not specifically from Kerala, but the students from uh, different states, they were saying that uh, we should uh, there should be some guidelines uh, regarding these ward rounds. Yes, uh, Doctor yeah. uh, Rajesh, uh, I take your point. In fact, this was a decision which was taken uh, uh, at a very short notice, and the proper information probably uh, didn't reach most of the centers. Although National Board. Did make every effort so that all the center coordinators have the information with regard to this. But I think the next examination that would be coming, the national board would be sending uh, the information uh, with regard to the different segments of the examination, particularly the ward rounds and what kind of patients should be there and uh, you know how it should proceed. They would be sending the information before time. I mean, before time in the sense with uh, uh, with with, uh, with with good uh, time for the. Coordinator to be clear about what is to be done because it is for the coordinator to select the patients for the ward rounds. So once he knows what exactly the purpose of this particular segment of the examination, I'm sure the patients selected for this would be uh, the would be better. I do hope that the coming examination, uh, the problem which the students faced in the first instance or the coordinators also were not very clear, will not be there next time. So the so NBS, a, a, NBS given a good web, webinar directions uh, before the exam to, to the coordinators regarding the ward rounds. It was very very clear direction. But there are centers where the ward rounds was done without patients. Actually, in spite of the national board strict instruction that there yes. should be ward rounds, all ward rounds four should be Must on real be. patient. Yes. And no scenario that the, the instruction was very clear. And, very and, and and there are centers where that also was done with scenarios. Well, uh, the national board is fully aware of this. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I did get to know of uh, this, yeah. and I'm sure the national board will take uh, every care yeah. that yeah. this time it doesn't happen. It was the first time yeah. it was introduced, and uh, hopefully, it won't happen the next time. And only in the second that practical case of of the center, the the coordinator has the liberty to choose patient, volunteer, yes. or a, or a. Uh, yes. Only in that the the center has the liberty to choose, but in the water right. rounds, the national board has not given the liberty to choose to do anything apart from giving real patients. Very true. Uh, I agree. In such was clear. In such was clear. Clear. In such was clear. This uh, you know for this particular uh, segment of the examination, uh, where the coordinator, center coordinator can choose one patient, he can even choose uh, a volunteer. I mean, yeah. four cases are there for the water rounds. That is separate. and this can be the fifth person whether he is a volunteer or he has some uh, problem on which uh, the examiner may like to ask the student to demonstrate a particular sign demonstrate a particular uh, uh, thing so he can be a, a, either a mannequin or he can be a real patient with finding or without finding who is a volunteer Uh, but just uh, the one more thing i had to point out is there uh, we had to uh, there is uh, mca guidelines as per mca guidelines eight candidates are to be examined on one day so uh, 
now uh, so if we stick to that eight students per one day we could have uh, uh, this time problem would have been uh, reduced to such an end. we have 12 to 13 candidates in each center so it was very difficult to have this much so if the if the as per mc guidelines if, if we restrict one day to eight candidates then this could have been better and there are centers where the examiners has where examination has went on till 10 o'clock in the night very so, true i i agree with you uh, no so, uh, this this uh, dnb examination last time yeah yeah yeah, it, it, yeah 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 there are centers in kerala i know center where the examiners went on examination went on till 10 o'clock in my center instead of 5 o'clock i could finish by 6 o'clock it's okay 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock is okay that's okay but mm. but but going to 10 o'clock and the students actually come, who personally was known to me was complaining of the center see they went on till 10 o'clock so that, that is because of lack of proper coordination this is 5 minutes went on to 15 minutes like that so that the national board should give instructions to strictly follow to the guide to to the uh, time schedule and this probably to follow the guidelines of the previous mca now the nmc to restrict the candidates to eight per day eight per day in in this in this situation would have been we will be able to finish it quite literally in five o'clock to over at six o'clock yeah with regard to the number of candidates yes it's national medical commission or the erstwhile uh, mci they had uh, a, a limit up to eight candidates maximum and uh, the national board also for some time was following this norm of seven to eight candidates uh, per day but uh, now with the uh, pandemic uh, you can understand that uh, national board of course wants uh, uh, the examinations with the patients to be conducted and you can see that with the patients uh, in the examination process even for five days of ward rounds since only four can be examined at a given time so those four are examined next four set comes and then the next four comes so it takes quite a lot of time so at least examining the candidates with the, their practical skills and their own knowledge i think it's better than having only theory kind of papers you can understand very well that you know the, uh, the universities are cancelling examinations for uh, various courses but here there is some sort of academic exercise which is being conducted with the best of intention to get the best out of the student with regard to his knowledge one and also with regard to the application of the knowledge and the skill that he has so you know since it is a new thing which is uh, coming out to be uh, which seems to be uh, getting uh, you know as much a new normal it will take some time for the things to be smooth and uh, to be uniform i'm i'm rather surprised that uh, in some centers as you say that it went on till 10 o'clock i don't think uh, it should be so because oski which is the main component of the examination is over by uh, by by 10:30 or 11 yeah, eight, by yeah, 11, 11 o'clock o'clock. right <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know thereafter what you are left with is the viva uh, the national board very clearly has set 5 minutes on each station so uh, all the students uh, you know they they clear then uske uh, baad there is a short tea break and then uh, there is a ward rounds right and ward rounds again the candidates are given 5 minutes each so that the examination finishes by by 5 or 6 hour by 5 is the limit which national board has kept it is to make sure that the students reach back their places uh, wherever they are staying uh, in time because uh, with the, with the kind of uh, pandemic situation which is there Uh, it is very unsafe uh, for travel as well because of the restrictions uh, here and there so national board wanted that the examination finishes by 5 o'clock but whenever i have uh, some discussion with the seniors i'm i i will take up uh, this point as well that the examination went i'm rather surprised uh, why should it go up to 10 i can understand from 5 to 6 or even you know uh, maybe 6:30 or so because uh, there is one way that the examination can prolong uh, beyond the time which the national board has set because it 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 needs a very good connectivity of uh, of of very good connectivity to the national board in case there is some disruption in the connectivity while the oski is being projected so that center is asked okay during the break that you had which were the oskis which could not be seen by the students and those Two, one, three, or whatever are the number of OSCEs. They are specifically projected for that particular center after all the twenty-five OSCEs have been projected uh, in all the centers. So that may take an additional time. But to go up to ten o'clock, well, that that's a real surprise. Maybe the examiners uh, had there, gone in for uh, uh, a little more uh, elaborate viva with regard to the ward round, yeah. which the national board wanted for five minutes. 
they might have gone yeah. for uh, 50, 50 10, 15, minutes. 20 yeah. minutes or so. Yeah. That, I, that could be the reason. Yeah, I, I have a point here, sir. Last sir, month, please. Sir. In the month of March, I had been to Bangalore for in one of the centers, sir. Ji. There also we went up to 640 <laughs> or something, something like that. Hmm. The main reason was, instead of five minutes, we had to take some more time for the candidates, each candidate, because in five minutes, we could not do anything at all, sir. That is the only reason. We could not stick on to the time of five minutes. That has uh, resulted in extension of the time. I think more than that. At, at okay. minutes, I feel minutes. five minutes is too short. Five minutes I, is too short. Sir, I free agree with you. And I think Dr. Mubarak also is very keen that it should be 10 minutes per student. Uh, maybe the next time when the examination is there, the national board will work out its timing a little more uh, uh, precisely. And uh, the time is a uh, little more. And I think uh, feedback from the center coordinators by the national board would be better to have to get experience. What were the problems here? Exactly. Because this is the first uh, yeah, that I think they, I can they can arrange a webinar or some communications or something to before planning for the next actually. Uh, the yes, I think now, that's theory a good is now over. Theory is now over. And results are awaited. So, to make a coordinator. Good point. They they did have a webinar last time also with the coordinators, that was, but that maybe the in, uh, maybe yeah, the yeah. Uh, you know information which they had conveyed wasn't uh, uh, conveyed uh, to the extent that the national board wanted it. Uh, uh, for the coordinators. Uh, hopefully, no. this time, they will do it better. And no, the, the, I've noted on the points, let's hope uh, that things will be better. This practical time is not like an OSCE. So, OSCE is sitting the time, four minutes, it is okay. But yeah. in, in the practical situation, when the candidates come, sits, breathes, and adapts to the, with the environment, it takes five, five, five minutes. And by the time, the time is over. Yeah, I, I know. Is, yeah, yeah. So. But, uh, you sure. know, what we had done was that we had yeah. uh, stationed, yeah. uh, you know, we had one central bell and all the examiners yeah. were told once the bell is there, you have to leave yeah. the candidate immediately. You release yeah, the yeah, candidate yeah. and the next yeah. four uh, students will walk in uh, uh, to the tables. So, well, but, but, but I'm sure most of the difficulties. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 yeah. I agree, sir. I agree. Okay. Okay, okay sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you for the nice interactions. And I think this will be taken up to the National Board. Yeah, yeah okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, Belgian, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mubarak, sir, also for the comments. And uh, that is a very good interaction. And uh, hope uh, this is going to be a reference uh, video session for the DNB coordinators and uh, as well as the DNB faculties and examiners. So over to Dr. Binil. Uh, Rajesh, this, this will be recorded and available in the video, no? Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, uh, it's yeah, recorded, yeah. it's available, sir. It's the, uh, even I think, now also okay. the recording is continuing. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it is I there think, in YouTube. Yeah. It is there yeah, in I, YouTube. So oh. I, think the, okay. I think this discussion can be very well taken to the National Board also for... Uh, for yeah, the if you want to rewind, yeah. then you can, uh, you can uh, <laughs> yeah. hear the yeah. discussion again and again if you want. Okay. It will be okay. there in YouTube. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And, Thank uh, you, for the concluding remarks, our president is there. Nasser, sir, please. Yeah, the both the speakers, uh, that was a very useful session and uh, especially the first part, uh, is, it's a review exam. I thank uh, Dr. Balji Singh and Dr. Arpigado for the excellent uh, uh, speech and sharing their experience. And thank you all uh, for your uh, active participation. Over to Binil. Thank you, sir. Uh, I extend my sincere thanks to today's faculties, Dr. Baljit Singh from Delhi and uh, Dr. R.P. Gedu from uh, Mumbai for their excellent uh, presentation. Uh, actually, I just called Baljit Singh sir and uh, Gedu sir for uh, their time for the presentation and without any resistance, both of them uh, came forward and presented very well. Always uh, pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anytime and for Kerala. Okay. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Even online. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you very yeah. much. Mm. I, and I extend my sincere thanks to our president-elect, Dr. Venkatagiri, 
our coordinators dr rajesh and dr vijish and uh, our uh, state president dr ek uh, m abdul nasser for uh, coordinating and uh, organizing this program i extend my sincere thanks to all the participants and the students who attended this uh, meeting i am sure <laughs> our students our dnv students will uh, replay the same session uh, in the youtube because uh, i i could feel that today the attendance was little bit less but i am sure the heat will be more after uh, hearing uh, the points which uh, uh, baljit singh sir explained about the examination or the exam going students will be 100% they will be replaying and replaying the same particular uh, meeting in the youtube thank, uh, you. thank you and uh, good night giri sir good any night. other comments thank any comments from giri sir for Nothing. before concluding so thank you thank you sir yeah and, giri giri so shall i close the meeting sir yeah yeah Thank you, thank, you. Everybody. Awesome. Everybody. Thank, thank you everybody thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone good night good night okay. good night